welcome. Hopefully, we are um, we're doing this in person, which is lovely. Because I love things in person. But I'm also going to be staring at the screen a little bit because we've got people joining us from home. So hello to people joining us from home. If there's an issue for people who are joining us online, please can you put something either in the chat box or in the Q&A so that I can see if you can hear us or not hear us. That would be cracking. The people live, welcome. Hopefully you can see me and hear me. Um, I've got a few announcements to start, so I'm going to introduce everybody first. So my name is Dr. Alice Brumby and I'm going to be chairing the event. I'll introduce my colleagues, um, Dr. James Cooper and Dr. Ian Howard in a moment. But firstly, I want to say thank you for coming here. Welcome. For those of you that walked up two flights of steps, well done. Um, the lift is also in operation. Um, I need to start by saying a couple of things to do with health and safety. So there are no fire alarms planned. So if there is a fire alarm, we just need to leave this building, follow the three of us, and we'll take you to the closest exit point. For anyone that needs a toilet, they are just outside this building, follow it down to the bottom and turn right. Pilots are down there, please nip in and out, make yourselves comfortable throughout this. In terms of people in the room, we're going to do questions at the end. So if you've got questions, brilliant. We'd love to hear them, but we're going to save them till the end of the presentation. For people that are joining us online, if you have questions throughout, pop it in the Q&A box, pop it in the chat for us, and I will monitor that as well. Um, I think that's it in terms of the generic announcements from me. So I'm going to hand over to you both of my colleagues. So Dr. Ian Howard teaches on our history, our American studies and our war studies programmes. He's written widely on air power and Vietnam. His latest book, which came out, did it come out last year, Ian? Yeah, that came out last year was entitled Quantifying Counterfactual History, and it's a really interesting one. Dr. James Cooper, who's sitting here, <coughs> features on the American history with us and American studies with us too. He's written extensively on the relationship between Thatcher and Reagan, and is the author of, is it three monographs now, Jim? Three monographs. Sure. And a joint one. Three monographs and a joint one. There you go. And um, so without further ado, I'm going to hand over to my colleagues. I'll kick her off. Uh, I'm going to stand up. Should I have a lecture? Yeah. Really? Uh, every, every, you know, event like this should have a lecture so that I can hide my notes. But I do actually have some notes, so I'm going to hear my own people here at those career overviews. So I apologise for that. Uh, this is uh, a presentation about. Um, well, essentially about unsuccessful presidential hopefuls, candidates for the presidency who, who were not successful, but our suggestion is uh, that their campaigns and their perspectives actually turned out to have much greater significance going forward than <coughs> the other defeat in the polls uh, would suggest. So without further ado, uh, can I uh, yeah, ask you to move those on? Without further ado, let's... Uh, We'll go to the, the first example, and this is uh, uh, the 1964 presidential election, uh, which was fought between uh, the uh, Republican candidate, Barry Goldwater, uh, and the Democratic candidate, Lyndon Johnson. And the result, can I get the next slide? Just very quickly. Um, the result was a decisive victory for Johnson. Johnson won heavily. Uh, in the popular vote, and that translated into a landslide with the Electoral College. And you can see that from this uh, electoral map. You can see that Johnson swept the board pretty much uh, with Goldwater just winning half a dozen states and uh, concentrated uh, in the southern United States. Now, no doubt there are 
many reasons for why Goldwater was defeated, <laughs> or defeated so handily. But certainly one of the reasons is that he was very much out of step with the uh, very much out, out of step with the with the times. Uh, if we were to characterize the 1960s in the United States, we might say that it was a period in which liberalism uh, was in the ascendant. This is a, a period of the civil rights movement, it's a period of developing student protest, and it's a period of uh, extensive uh, progressive reform legislation instituted by the Kennedy and then Johnson uh, administrations. Uh, and none of those ideas sat very well uh, with Barry Goldwater. It's also the case that Goldwater presented a, a, a very aggressive kind of foreign policy formulation to the American public, and that also did not go down well. <laughs> Yet, uh, in 1980, on the election of Ronald Reagan, uh, the Washington Post columnist George Wills uh, was to argue that it was actually Goldwater who won the 1964 election, not Johnson, and that it just took 16 years to count the votes. So, uh, to start with, I've used the term liberalism. I said liberalism uh, ascendant, uh, and I'm going to look at these definitions myself. Um, I, that's a word I think that we use quite lazily. In fact, we use political terms generally quite lazily. Fascist is the favourite thing. Um, and uh, but liberalism is no exception. So just a few things about liberalism, the kind of liberalism uh, which we, uh, which was occurring, if you like, in the 1960s in the United States. The United States is what political scientists call a liberal democracy. And so I've, I've got a definition there. Uh, that's a society based on fundamental individual rights, such as freedom of speech, freedom of religion, and equality under the law. And we might add to that also, in the United States case, an acceptance of the free market as the fundamental device for the production, distribution, and exchange of goods. Since the 1930s, uh, with the establishment of Franklin Roosevelt's New Deal, Liberalism in the United States, the term liberalism in the United States, has come to mean primarily social liberalism. So I've got another definition then. Social liberalism espouses the expansion of civil and political rights, such as voting rights for all, and recognises the government's responsibility to promote the general welfare of its citizens by means such as national social services, such as educational opportunities and access to health care. Social liberals also uh, see the expansion of these civil and political rights uh, contained within these definitions. They see these as being consistent with the freedom of the individual. And that's the kind of liberalism I think which obtained primarily uh, in the 1960s, that way Americans had come to understand the term. Next slide. We can add to that uh, another liberal. <coughs> But we can add uh, what people called the liberal economics at the time, which uh, drew extensively on the work of the British economist John Maynard Keynes. Uh, and Keynes was such a significant historical figure that he had an ism named after him. That's Keynesianism. Uh, and there's a, a, a simplistic uh, definition of what Keynesianism means uh, that optimal economic performance can be achieved, and economic slumps prevented by influencing demand through the intervention of the government in the economy. So Keynesianists and indeed the US government of John Kennedy uh, and then Lyndon Johnson, they believed that it really was the business of government to at least tinker with the margins of the economy in order to try and stimulate growth uh, and head off uh, recessions or depressions by pumping federal money yeah, into the economy. Next slide. So now, just to complicate the issue, uh, I'd like to learn another kind of liberalism, another use of, of the term liberalism. This is classical liberalism or libertarianism. Uh, 
um, proponents of classical liberalism uh, subscribe to liberalism's fundamental individual rights, such as freedom of speech, freedom of religion, and equality under the law, just as the social liberals do. Uh, and they also accept the free market as the fundamental device to the production of production and exchange of goods. Um, but they differ from social liberals by arguing that economic freedom is a precondition for political freedom. So essentially what they say is that the US government should leave people's wages alone. Uh, they should allow them to spend them how they see fit, uh, because uh, if the government gets involved uh, with those, uh, those wages, takes lots of them in taxes, etc., uh, then that is uh, a suppression of people's individual freedom. They know best what to do with their money. The US government doesn't know quite as well uh, what to do with individuals' money. Uh, so they believe also that providing the general welfare, or at least to some extent, some of them believe this, uh, that providing for the general welfare really exceeds the legitimate role of, of government. There might be times when the, the government needs to provide for the general welfare of parts of the population uh, with social security provision, uh, like say um, unemployment benefits or uh, old age pensions. But for the most part, that's not really the business of the government. That's what classical liberals believe. Uh, so in contrast, this kind of liberalism, classical liberalism, with the social liberalism, which was uh, dominant in the early 1960s, and they're really opposites. Uh, classical liberalism, being more normal to use the term these days, concerns classical liberalism rather than liberal. But these ideas, these classical liberal ideas, uh, they run fashion in the early 1960s. The fact is, however, they had not gone away. Uh, they had a rich intellectual tradition, uh, which can be called on, and indeed uh, significant uh, classical liberal thinkers were, were producing new material uh, even in the early 1960s. And here's one example, just one example, Milton Friedman, Friedman the economist, he wrote a book called Capitalism and Freedom uh, in uh, 1962. Uh, and in that, he attacked Keynesian economics and he advocated the kind of classical liberalism that we talked about uh, earlier. And he was, by the way, a policy advisor to the 1964 election campaign of Barry Goldfield. Okay, Goldwater himself, then, Barry Goldwater, uh, Republican candidate in 1964. Um, Goldwater signaled his view of what US politics should look like uh, in a book which he published in 1960, uh, which is called The Conscience of a Conservative. Uh, and uh, this was, uh, he didn't actually write it himself, it was ghostwritten. Uh, but he believed in just about everything that was in the book. And I think everything was in the book by the end of his life. Um, and so what that book presented was a kind of blueprint for modern conservatism. And it's really on most of these ideas uh, that Goldwater ran the 1964 election campaign. So these are things that he argued for in the conscience of a, of a conservative. He was critical of the kind of social liberalism that we talked about, and he thought it was damaging. Uh, and he thought that actually you would need to uh, try and uh, resolve the damage already done by uh, social liberal policies uh, in the early 1960s. So his, his big complaint was the expansion of the welfare state. The Americans don't like to say that they have a welfare state, but they do have one of sorts. And that had become much more extensive since the Roosevelt administration in the 1930s. But Goldwater said this undermined individual freedom and he needed to defend people from the consequences of it. So he objected to what he called a handout culture, giving money to people when actually it would be better to try and encourage them to rely on their own resources. Um, he promoted a low tax economy. Uh, he wanted to get the federal government as much as possible out of people's lives. So he, was, uh, he supported the idea of small government 
It also, importantly, he argued for, in the conscience of the Conservative, voluntary social security. Uh, so this would be where you pay tax for, say, unemployment benefit or um, old age pensions. What uh, Goldwater said was, you should have a choice. Uh, if, if you don't pay tax into the system, you won't get these things. But you'll have the money. You can decide what to do with the money you would otherwise have paid in tax in order to look after yourself in the future. Why shouldn't American citizens do this? Why should they pay for everybody else? So if they look after themselves, then that's the American way. Next slide, please. Uh, a few more things. Uh, he was uh, opposed to what he describes as liberal permissiveness. Now, this is in 1960, so imagine before the end of the decade. Uh, he was a proponent of uh, defense of the role of uh, family and church, uh, a decentralizer. He supported states' rights, um, which he thought was constitutionally ordained in the United States that the federal government should try and keep out of. States, what he saw as states issued, uh, defender of property rights, and uh, felt that he was a pro uh, uh, that he was promoting the interests of both big, big business and the average American. And there is a big dollar of anti communism as well in the conscience of the conservative. Next one. Okay, um, late in the 1964 election campaign on the 27th of October 1964, Goldwater received an endorsement. Uh, in the form of a televised speech uh, by the actor Ronald Reagan, who doubtless you heard of, from the President of the United States. Uh, and that speech is known as uh, the, the time for choosing speech, in which Reagan offered a choice between what he suggested was the big intrusive government of the Democrats uh, and the small government offered by Goldwater, which supposedly would preserve fundamental American liberties. Goldwater's camp was actually reluctant to show the speech, uh, primarily because in the speech, uh, Reagan endorsed one of those policies which we saw in the Conscious of the Conservatives. He endorsed the idea of voluntary social security. Um, Goldwater's team said, well, that may be an idea that you believe in, Barry Goldwater, but it's not something we should tell the American people, because there's a lot of Americans who won't be enthusiastic. About this in the context of 1964. Uh, Goldwater uh, eventually heard the speech, it was played to him, and he, he couldn't see anything wrong with it. Uh, and he agreed that it should be shown. Uh, the speech was extraordinarily powerful. You can find it uh, on YouTube. It's, it's a great listen. Reagan was indeed the great communicator. Um, and it's been credited with launching Reagan's political career. Reagan would go on to run for and win the governorship of California in 1966, and then of course he'd become president of the United States. Uh, it seems to have had a dramatic effect on funding for Goldwater's campaign, perhaps a million dollars worth in 1964 values, uh, but it didn't alter the result of the election. Uh, but in losing, however, next one, please, um, Goldwater's campaign really, I think, represented the birth of the modern American conservative movement. As you can see, like 27 million votes, that's only 38.5% of the popular vote. But it's a start. There's a significant number going forward, even though he didn't win many states. Uh, his campaign offered the prospect of a fundamental political realignment if Americans were willing to accept it, <laughs> the choice between liberalism and conservatism rather than Democrat and Republican. Uh, it also indicated that it might well be worth concentrating on the southern states because, as you know, Goldwater's victories tended to be in the south. Uh, he won lots of counties which had never been Republican in the past, except solidly Democrat in the past. And Goldwater showed that Republicans could, could penetrate that, uh, especially if they promoted states' rights on the civil rights issue. Uh, and uh, uh, by 1968, in fact, conservatives, people who were much more inclined to these ideas, dominated uh, the Republican Party. Next slide. Uh, so, um, going forward to the uh, 1968 election, which was between Richard Nixon for the Republicans and Hubert Humphrey for the Democrats, this is Lyndon Johnson's old vice president. 
Um, the, uh, the movement for the kind of conservatism that Goldwater was talking about obviously is not successful in 1964, but it had much more traction by 1968. And that's because Americans were increasingly alienated by things like the war in Vietnam, by domestic civil disorder, and by what they saw as a rebellion amongst young people, all of which seemed to be a function uh, of the liberal policies of the Johnson administration. So American politics was moving to the right. Next slide, thank you. That transformation was by no means complete in 1968, because although Richard Nixon, the Republican candidate, won the election, he only did so by less than one percent. That translate, translated into a reasonable victory in the Electoral College, but it was quite a number of voters. Uh, next slide, please. The 1972 election would show that uh, conservative attitudes were now thoroughly entrenched in the United States, uh, and, and Nixon won uh, a landslide in that year. Next one. Okay, um, now, following the 1972 election, uh, the 1976 election was won by Jimmy Carter, who's a Democrat. But my suggestion here is that, and Jim may say something different, uh, was that, that Carter's victory was perhaps primarily a, a function of, of the rejection of uh, Nixon because of his association uh, with the war game there. Uh, so uh, in 1976, obviously Nixon had gone, having served uh, one and a bit terms, and, and then been forced to resign from the presidency. Uh, in 1976, Americans elected uh, a Democrat. But Carter proved to be a one term, or Carter's proved to be a one term presidency uh, in which he himself moved increasingly to the right. Uh, uh, and Reagan, as of course Goldwater's cheerleader from 1964, would win a decisive victory in 1980. So, uh, some conclusions then about the meaning of Goldwater's 1964 campaign. So, I've suggested Goldwater lost the 1964 election because he was out of step with the liberalism of the times. He defined a, bit, a vision of American conservatism, which of course was wholly endorsed by Ronald Reagan, whose political career was launched in the back of Goldwater's campaign. The very liberalism against which Goldwater campaigned in 1964 contributed, I think, in no small part to the realignment of American politics to the right. So while Goldwater was out of step with that social liberalism of the 1960s, that very social liberalism turned off so many American voters that they moved to the right and eventually would elect Ronald Reagan. And we see that working out, I think, working through in the late 1960s and through Nixon's 1968 and 1972 campaigns. Clearing the way, I think, for Goldwater's perspective on the presidency to be realized in the shape of Ronald Reagan's victory in the 1980s. And I'm going to hand things over to Jim. I mean, doubt this, we're talking about Ronald Reagan. Yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you all for coming on today. Um, get on the parts of the screen, there's still some chairs scattered around the world. Um, so in terms of Reagan, I'm sure all many are aware, of course, all this is moving around, so uh, they, I know this is kind of but yeah, they did play would be playing um, Reagan. And so Reagan, of course, as we know, he was a whole elector. Um, he's the first and only union guy to be elected president of the United States. Um, he was the chair of the screen actor skill. So that's kind of where he got the debating skills, the negotiation skill, and so on. He was a reasonable actor, he has a very much kind of movie actor. Um, he's pretty still in his house, like Spike Kid and Panzee, Bess on Fonda, um, but also he gave some wonderful performances as a, as a, a George Gibb, you know, Wing Wong the Gibber, um, or in a one movement that they're saying, where his kind of legs chucked off, he waves and 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 yeah, the Reagans to come on the Kardashians. So I've got a version where you can see the Reagan family kind of like using these new electronic equipment and so on. 
Um, so he's not, it's kind of always been in American homes many years back. But being said, in 64, he um, comes out as a Republican um, advertising and promoting for Barry Goldwater. Um, and of course, in 66, he won the World Cup. England, with um, Reagan wins the Commission of Power Boys, which is what Nixon couldn't do. In 66, Richard Nixon had to lose to Kennedy in 1960. He goes on to try and sound the South people in California in 62 and to lose it. And this is when Nixon kind of writes his famous. Well, he needs to keep around the ball. He, you know, says he's going to retire and put it off. But Reagan becomes a guy and runs um, for um, office in California. And so to say that this is kind of the age of Reagan humor, um, as we would say, Reagan. And so he was a good as well. When you think about American politics in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, it's very different to how it was today. So even Democrats and Republicans, you have liberal Democrats and liberal Republicans. You have conservative Democrats, conservative Republicans. So, for example, the South, a solid Democrat. These aren't kind of like the, I don't know, Barack Obama, the like any Democrats. These are segregationists, racists, um, who basically vote Democrats solid because obviously Lincoln, who's been the slaves, kind of was a Republican. So, partisan politics are even fluid and different. Then, as the insane, yes, it sits, things start to crystallize more and Republican Party the French Party of Conservatives, and the Democrats become very much the party of liberalism. So, yeah, the French guys. So, Reagan then, as for the California, he has this kind of like embryonic policy type approach that uh, runs for 68, where Nixon's the one, Nixon wins. Um, being California, very keen to go in as like a favorite son candidate. Um, but that doesn't really go anywhere, and so he kind of holds his, his power dry. He launched properly in 76 to challenge Gerald Ford for the Republican nomination. Uh, Ford, of course, loses the cards narrowly. And in 1980, also, Ronald Reagan is his time um, to win the presidency. Um, and Reagan, when he wins the presidency in 1980, Spack was very much a strong defense, no taxes, smaller governments. Um, and that's, that's Reagan. Reagan's very consistent in terms of his rhetoric. It's moment he endorsed Reagan all the system. So the people in America don't know what they get. With Reagan, um, next slide. When it comes to the Reagan, well, when he's coming to California, he's much more liberal than he lets on. So I should just work with Democratic um, like, um, um, statements. Um, so he has to share power with Democrats in the So actually, passes some very, very, very liberal um, environmental legislation in terms of reproductive rights. Um, he has a very sensitive at these times. Um, so this is rhetoric. We're going to try to carry uh, the Reagan into the starving of the conservative movement. As Ian said, in 1906, um, Gerald Ford ultimately loses to Jimmy Carter. Um, yes, um, it's a very contradictory electoral clause in the end of Bill Carter. In terms of popular vote, though, it's only a couple of percent. And I read an alternative history a couple of years ago um, where um, it worked out that actually, say, like a few tens of thousands of votes in the Midwest based on Michigan. And voted differently, or it could have won by the not, not truly, it could have won by the electoral college. So it shows the impact and the importance of the electoral college. So next slide, please. So really, the thing is, was Ford really doing that battle? When he loses the Carter, was Gerald Ford who was really doing that very well? At one point, for the Republican Party, after the water gets as much in Nixon, 18% of Americans identified. So as the board said, it's like an existential crisis for the Republican Party. What's going to happen next? So what you see going, um, the, the polls do start to tighten um, as you get into the 76 election. So not comfortably in April, you know, it's in June, and summer, it's kind of like clear parts to lose. But you get down to it in October, it starts to narrow. This is pretty much despite Charles Ward and his TV led Carter and saying that there was no Soviet occupation of Eastern Europe. Um, I was like, what? You know, the whole Ford is very much coming through. Actually, quite the nice guy, Gerald Ford, kind of got some chocolate and food. Um, so he's never elected vice president, never elected president. Um, he's also the common vice president, vice president, um, when he gets off of the game by Nixon. So, next time. So, as so if you look at approval, when Gerald Ford comes out to war scale, absolutely surprisingly, his approval rating is huge. At 70 plus, but Joe Biden would love to have these numbers right now. What does it Gerald Ford is he pardons Nixon comes? When he pardons Nixon, that lack of trust in the government comes back. This is one of the great ironies if you look at the Pinnacle of the 70s and 80s, where the candidate who talks about government being the problem 
for a rain, she restores the interest in him. Um, with his very kind of historical irons. So um Gerald Hall then he kind of his opinion approval uh opinion um approval rate kind of collapse they kind of steady out as you said um during the rest of his presidency um thank you but for Gerald Ford though the problem of course is one of Gerald Ford initially was president thinking I'll do it for a couple of years and then I'll retire because his plans to retire he'd been minority the Republicans in Congress for a while he thought well I'll just set down and say set yourself Go back to Michigan and watch some, you know, college football and hang out with Jesse and have a last time. But that, of course, he seems to be called president after a few months. He starts on the job. So, yeah, actually, what you know, it's like Air Force One, have you? You know, and the uh, food and that kind of stuff. Uh, yeah. So, and Betty Ford is actually an extremely charismatic, um, successful, powerful, big and fast first lady. But Reagan, if he announced the 75, he's going to challenge her. This is quite an unusual thing to happen. So Ford, of course, is the president of the company, he's a Republican, and he's Reagan, he's a Republican, all going to California, he's no longer doing that job. He announces he's going to declare, he's going to run for the nomination, try and take it from him. And of course, the Ford people are actually stunned, so Gerald Ford takes a phone call from Reagan. What are you doing, man? This is a party, you see that? Get behind me, you can do it for his story, doesn't it? Reagan's out, and he's going to run for the presidency. Price is concerned, the board administration failing, and they're not conservative. Straight away, I just got this the other day from a um, board library. Anyone who's interested in presidential history, often the digitalization of what archives are happening over there, we have to rate. So if you have a lot of loose ends, going on with Alan DJ, Reagan Line, Flinton Library, Flinton was kind of functioning, he was an event of our pages in Leo and the KFC and Silver. It's all very kind of group up and back to the way it was. But basically, when a brain decides to go to run, um, the, the four team do a bit of planning, they can actually let him run. Because essentially, our weapon's going to be that General Ford is president, so you can't campaign anywhere. So, if Reagan wins some primaries, that's fine because he's running full time. That's his new job. And Ford, of course, he can't campaign anywhere, so if he loses some primaries, that's fine because he's president. But in the end, we're winning the primaries, we're winning the nomination, and he plays the power of the signal, carry the day, Gerald Ford. So, the next slide is it. So, but Reagan becomes <laughs> a real problem. In March 76, he starts to articulate the type of thing that gold will be talking about. That type of message goes on and on and on throughout the rest of the Senate and into his presidency. But Reagan talks about actually debt, inflation, unemployment, taxes. He said that basically the country is in decline. That actually, Gerald Ford, even though both Republicans, he does not accept the fact that there's a difference between them. But actually, Republican voters do have a choice in this fight. Do they really want? Gerald Ford or the one not What Gerald Ford is trying to do, he's trying to finally put back together the uh, Republican coalition at Three Wars Camp, where you have the Ishmael's and the Surge Mass and the Middle East. And he's built on Dixon's use of the Sun strategy. But Reagan's is actually, no, forget that, we need a brand new coalition. I'm going to basically take what Goldwater achieved on the Sports Reception in the city Four, and this is some strategy built. So Reagan wants to create a whole new group. After the break, he was to become the part of the conservative movement. And he uses these points about the promise of the economy, inflation, national debt, taxes, to really kind of bang home the drug of actually why not just for but successive administrations fail. You notice how basically General Ford basically in 12 months has basically doubled the US session. Reagan is a massive problem. Another key point of the speech, which very much people very familiar with Reagan, the second half of the century and when he becomes president as well. We can talk about there are differences, so yeah, actually inflation is caused by a recession and all of them. It's basically inflation is a problem, and it's caused by a government state. So remember Reagan in Isaac and he was elected the president, even back in then generated one who was sworn in, takes over office, and he says government is not the solution to the problem, government is the problem. It's not only in some of you moments ago, this hanging in economics is dominated consensus. But if someone to stand up as president and say, government is the problem, this is quite a radical thing at the time. So, yeah, this is a yeah, big sense for a while. Um, so, it's almost a resurgence of like classical liberal um, ideas. Uh, but also, he goes after Ford and goes after Nixon and starts talking more about why he's running for president. So, that actually, Ford is basically spirit essentially in, in all politics. Gerald Ford for 25 years trying to get the best he could for a small district in Michigan. But Reagan, who was good in California, he was basically one of the large, led one of the largest economies in the world. Much more qualified than President Shaw. But also, he goes out to Kissinger, 
It's easy to get on overnight, so it's easy to get hold of the bicycle, kids are doing lots, even during the winter, even at the height of these powers, kids are becoming a very, very toxic thing in the service of the politics. And kitchen is the most prepared way to deal with the Soviet Union. But it's actually no shock to deal with it. You know, I feel better. You know, it's the EU empire. But you can't accept a second message. Uh, we're not going to have peace from weeks. This is why, you know, in 1981, Britain flat out refused to get anywhere near his own box. We just want to that until the next slide. Yeah. So again, it's all these kind of million kind of. Um, Especially if you get into the 1964 and Tom Chusen speech in Goldwater, but also the Fatima Empire speech, uh, the speech of the Reagan speech created. It's talked about the mysticism. I thought it was a divine purpose to the United States. Reagan notices it for him, isn't his job to be the evils of communism. And um, that's what he But actually, we need to have to go back to normal like original and emergent constitution, go back to this idea that actually it's got a kind of government argument about being important. That actually, you know, the government are servants, not the masses. The very much like a reversal of what you had in the previous 10 to 15 years ago. Next slide, so let's go. And you also get a kind of classic rain in the sense that when he's um, doing this big speech in March, right, in May, where he keeps it almost like, put on this classic rain in the pocket, it's already going to happen. But how a little girl asked him, why you were present? And he said, well, no, I was trying to reduce, you know, the wrong scene, the donation, the and that's his answer. When he gets home, he sorts the Nancy and says, Well, actually, I shouldn't have said that. What I should have said was, Actually, I want to be president because of me, such a little girl, because I want you to have to be resigned when I'm such a girl, growing up in the end of the So, what's up to kind of throw back to what's the American about house um, never was? And of course, it's the point of myself where actually you, you think about the past and you can't look back to it, also, you don't want it. Um, okay. okay, so in response to where, uh, so where Reagan then gives his big televised address about his campaign, he starts to think about then some scientific primaries against Sheriff the board, um, the board's in a panic, he could they actually lose the nomination to Reagan? Could the president of the Secrets not even actually be the nominee um, in 1976? And you see the attack on being drawn where it's just the part, first part of the document where it's um, Reagan's speech is almost pure demagoguery. Um, facts are wrong, mischaracterizations, grossly misleading. And this, of course, is a criticism which actually Reagan received a lot, where you know, he's very very to speak about the welfare group, but amalgamates lots of clients. But also, probably, what they call untrue stories um, about say, African women, American women, and welfare, say, and it's just, um, And he goes on to stop a lot of sources that we've on pulling apart Reagan's speech. So the board team, they are well aware. The threat of Reagan and conservatives is so serious that Jericho might not actually win the nomination. So he gets into the primaries, and basically it's a very good closure. At first, Reagan's <coughs> in the very well, got fixed nominations, but the final results are very telling. So Reagan ends up 47% of the votes, 2% of the votes goes to the uh, Board. But some sort of the delegates at the moment, just not the Electoral College, instead of the Spats. So back with Obama was the presidency, um, in terms of the vote for Democrats in the primaries and the caucuses, given that there is a very, very neck and neck, very tight, which the delegates also would come here over the top. Um, and so, after the primaries, it's, it's broken convention. It's sort of the first time in decades, they don't have the 19th century style of having broken convention. But actually, the opponents go to their primaries, go to their convention, have no idea what the nominations should be. Normally, of course, you know, Giles, Cities, past nominations. Uh, we know who the nominee is, we know who the vice president is, and they, there's speeches and balloon drops, all the school teachers tell us story. It's all a bit silly, really. Well, you know, even in the party. But you go to see them not know who will be the nominee president of the Institute of Data. Uh, but ultimately, um, Gerald Ford sneaks out of the line in the end of the He gets enough um, delegates. Um, what you see is these are two people competing, competing with two different versions and visions for the Grand North Park. So it's a bit like how Trump took over the Republican Party. Reagan is sort of taking over this Republican Party. And you see this when Reagan steals the shirts next time. So Reagan, uh, at the end of the uh, convention, because you know, basically Reagan's always won it, he's lost. And um, he's asked to do a speech. Because Reagan claims a sort of impromptu speech, and he knows what he's going to say. Of course, you just know what he's going to say. Because you have to have the TV screens of Reagan forward. Holding hands, having a nice bit of a fair look and being best friends, struggling with something not different. 
for the post. And Reagan says in his uh, impromptu speech, how um, he was asked in the day to do a time capsule. It's going to take me back to the answer, you back to the sort of time capsule. One day, sort of open time capsule to see what toys we have, what sweets we're eating. They look like so much better. And Reagan uses this idea of the time capsule to say, actually, I did a time capsule, and it occurs to me that one day, if you open this, they'll know how things have turned out. They'll know if we avoid a nuclear line approach. They'll know if it's something. They'll know how we're cold. They'll know if actually we've lost America and we didn't choose to be the sex And he said basically, this is a challenge. We'll actually, the future will know we have that individual in one with that. And if you look at oral history, look at documents and testimony of people who are there, the people in the arena, in the room, that are coming from parts of it, they all leave thinking, nominate the long enough. Because Reagan was able to communicate the future and the ideas so much more eloquently, so much more carefully, about the vision of what America should be than Gerald Ford ever was going to. Uh, next slide, please, Alex. So, what you was Gerald Ford there, the nice thing to see uh, Elusive and Carter, um, and then again for the guys here. Nice and easy, Reagan, of course, four years later, dominates um, the election. Jimmy Carter has seen it um, before polls closed in California. It was wrong to say, even for California, some time zone difference, even for California to start voting, can't be kind of like saying, okay, no, yeah, congratulations, President. Next slide, please. So, and it's very much clear that Reagan, before he gets the 1980 presidential election record, was believed in certain It goes back right to the U.S. to California. And it's, it doesn't matter what he did to California, it's his wrestling. The fact he was the guy who talks on the book, he's the guy who's just calling it, the messages are sad. They made his career out of him. So it was throughout the 1960s, throughout the 1970s, when he's not actually, um, when he's lost his service, he's going to stick to campaign. People think he's finished. But he's a great show. He can break his door with newspaper columns. All this thing on the leaders. Reagan is still very much a picture. Um, so he's very much the leader of this movement. Next slide. Michael D. Blight, he was the uh, new 2000 auditioner. Uh, he was Reagan's deputy chief of staff. He was a PR guy before he was Reagan White House. He's also John's also racial Nancy. That was one of the leaders in the most important. So why was the Congress? In 1980, the election campaign, slowly is the times now for Reagan. So it's the idea that actually, okay, let's look at you know, Reagan was right all along. So the times now for Reagan. And why was the time now for Reagan? The, the, the answer is always, not always, but you know, dead. Um, so in terms of 1976, in terms of um, opinion polling, half the country think the direction of the country is going okay. It's not that it's Joe Ford's president and Jim Carter trying to do the same thing. Half the country in America seems actually be very okay. The number one problem in our 76 election is inflation. 43% of Americans say that inflation is the number one problem. It is. That's why it's actually In terms of the economy, in terms of state economy, about, you know, basically all about half or so, um, just over half say actually the economy's okay. okay. And so the personal financial situation is like, it's, you know, it's all right. But a third of people saying that we're not that happy personally because of that. Next slide, please. Next slide. So then it gets to number, number 18, like 1980. Again, in terms of the rest of the country, um, still over half, so 6% of the Americans think actually the direction of the country is actually over that. But inflation is still the number one issue. 31% of Americans say inflation is on one issue. And the next one down is the next one, please. Then some of the economy, half the country thinks it's good, half the country is bad. If it's a personal financial situation, you've got a significant number of people saying actually it's getting worse. One of the Americans saying actually it's getting worse. So the economic picture from 1976 to 1980 hasn't changed. People feel poor. They think actually maybe the system isn't working anymore. What have we brought up? And as my dad was home growing up, people vote in their wallets. And they decided in the nice days actually straw all dots. Let's try to make the time is now for Reagan. So, so it's not just me. Barack Obama himself, 2007, but it's what he increasingly in their primaries um, criticizing for because Obama had the audacity to say that Reagan really changed the trajectory of America. And Senator Obama, he's actually President Reagan was transformed. Whether you like it or not, because basically Americans were ready for change. So it was economic, cultural, social, the, you know, the, the moment was there for a new direction. Because I mean, Bill Clinton didn't do this, Nixon didn't do this, but Reagan did. 
One of the things about the 20th century, you have FDR and Ronald Reagan, which two very massive oil transformers of tools. FDR is very huge. They said the government is good. Reagan, the legacy is going to be bad. I feel like his children um, in the 90s to 2000s kind of like really run with that rhetoric much more than Reagan than the next guys. Let's look at a similar story. So, George Bush Sr., when he runs in 1980, um, sort of against Reagan, he was Reagan's vice president. In the primaries, he argues that Reagan's policies of Basically, you cut taxes and economy grow and all the next supply some policy and tax cuts and financing, he calls it voodoo economics. In 1988, after eight years of being Reagan's vice president, he makes the pledge to read my lips and no taxes, which is a proper Reagan now. Of course, that's Reagan tax. And of course, he loses not so like Reagan in 1982-83 did the biggest tax increase in American history. But we don't think about that. It's great. And he said 20 minutes about my tax. The Northern Insights 1988, he was, of course, in response to Reagan and Democrats realized that to win a national election, to win the presidency, then they had to change. You didn't need Democrats to do Labour. Clinton was a big figure in this. Um, then he said that he gives a keynote for um, to Capitals at his own convention. He's not amazing. And Clinton, he bombs her. So when he comes back in 1992 as the presidential nominee, he jokes that I'm like, he's going to finish a speech starting four years ago by Obama, 2004, he's running for Senate. So he's basically a state senator in 2004. So he's trying to try and get into the US Senate. And he gives a keynote speech in Florida to John Kerry. So he's a big dramatic, you know, red states, blue states. Of course, what was Obama is not just that speech, but also Obama, of course, was in the Senate to vote for or against the Iraq war. Of course, Walter was a community organizer, and you know, that kind of stuff. He would talk about the Iraq war being bad. So Obama therefore got the nomination in 2008 because of his speech in 2004 because Hillary Clinton, like John Kerry, had voted for the Iraq war. Donald Trump, 2016. Donald Trump, he kind of did the total war in 2012, you know, he decided not to. But if he then went to do this whole birth of his service about you know, Obama not being born in the United States and you know, the foreign it. So that kind of brings us to national political attention of this action in the 2016, of course. The Republicans, you know, relates to any point. So I think what we're saying is that it's actually from the themes and legacies of previous elections tell you a lot about the current and future elections. That's one of the, you know, about actually the, about the, the pattern. That's the key for understanding the president that's actually not the previous one. Um, but also to try to make some predictions or outcomes of the future of American politics. You look at this one and look at like, what happened in the background. Who are the issues leaders? We're not winning the presidency this time around. How might they happen? Um, next slide, so yeah, obviously, before um, you leave, you've done a should not get an email on the survey, but this is like a 30 second thing. But if you're able to, on your way out, please, it's QR code. I felt like 20 years younger, thank you. <laughs> Um, anyway, um, that's it. Well, talk so. Okay, so if we just say thank you first, and then that will go to question. I for one really enjoyed that. You're gonna have to bear with me as I I'm gonna take questions in the room first, and then I'm gonna have to figure out how a computer works. So. Uh, Please forgive me if I look like I'm not giving you all my 100% attention. But does anybody in the room have a question that they'd like to start with, for either for Jim or for Ian, or just generally thrown in this direction? Yes. What do you think about the significance of Gary Hart in 1988 with like his famous affair and the fact that he was a frontrunner? That's one of the, the positive parts that become that for the frontrunner almost, and after that. Well, I, this was a nice guy. Yeah. Um, to catch a lot of nice guys. Well, um, I, years ago, there was a lot of fellowship. I don't worry. No, no, no. There was a, a, a lady that was a professor at his college, and the faculty was applied to one of our colleagues in the faculty. I don't know, actually, we've done a lot of things too, but yeah, um, obviously, all the things are different. Yeah. But it's like now, in terms of like, what kind of scandal in that kind of stuff. Like, look at Trump's numbers now. Yeah, it wouldn't happen. No one cares. Um, Bill Clinton, no one can, he got like, he, he, he popped the head up um, after his, uh, well, I was just actually in hindsight, terrified. Um, and Gary Hart, as well, how can you, you know, it, it, I, especially in terms of the context of, it's almost a height of the plan, height of the sort of value, it's like, you know, just push it out, so 
Australia also took a bit of Jimmy Carter, who was himself, who was MC6 AP. He's a minister in the he's, he's a Baptist minister. So he turns into the political scholarly. But they just accomplished the conference. Where Kerry Hart was like now, he was like, he was like Bill Clinton, and he was like, oh. Well, I just can't invite the journalist to come with him. I can't remember the figure. So, I mean, he thought that uh, journalists didn't do with those kind of issues. They didn't do with those kind of issues, say, in the UK, it was what you would say. But he wasn't saying, uh, you know, the theory of when presidents would say they are saying, you know, they can do it even if they want to see. It's a suggestion that there is a, a continuum of, of republicanism from Nixon, obviously, then through. Reagan. What would have happened, counterfactual, if Bobby Kennedy had not been assassinated in 1968? There was a suggest, strong suggestion that he could well be the Democratic candidate and won the presidency. How does that, how would that go? How would you deal with your arguments if that had been the case? I <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I mean, I agree with you that he probably would have won the election. But he'd be likely to have been nominated because he was most likely to win. I think people thought that. And he, and he would have won. Um, uh, I suspect maybe uh, Bobby Kennedy was swimming against the tide of history because he was a, he's a throwback, isn't he, to his brother and to, and to Johnson. Uh, and I'm, I'm not sure those ideas would have flown. I think mm -hmm. Americans would still have been disappointed with the, the disorder of the 60s. They would have been disappointed with the pace of civil rights. Um, the war would still have been problematic. Resolve, I mean, it took a genius like Nixon to resolve the issue of the war to get a problematic issue. So uh, I suspect that our projection about the way U.S. politics would have swung to the right, the significance of the Republicans. I think that still flies, even with the Republican ribbons. Yeah. It's just that obviously Watergate had a, had an effect, didn't it, on that Republican mm -hmm. continuum? It, it that, did. Yeah. And I just wonder if Bobby Kennedy could have ended the Vietnam War earlier, that he would have been successful and therefore the Democrats would have been on some sort of continuum rather than the Republicans. Well, I mean, obviously, we're in serious counterfactual territory. So and I don't mind who being here. Who yeah, else do I, I don't answer. mind being here. Um, but it, and you, I think Nixon's approach to the war, actually, in terms of uh, the politics of it, was really, it was perfect as far as American politics is concerned. It wasn't perfect as far as the war was concerned, because you, you could finish the war precipitately in, in 1968 when Nixon became president you could have just ended the war I don't know whether Bobby Kennedy would have done that but he might well have ended it more quickly but of course Nixon said well yeah sure I do want to end the war but it has to it has to be so-called peace with all of them well, I think that was pure genius because the Americans the American public did buy that idea uh, that you couldn't end from a point of weakness uh, uh, you, you did have to be seen to be to have produced some kind of result from the war, and that wouldn't be the case if you if you went into war precipitately. So uh, you know, I'm not sure an, an early an early end to the war would have been a good thing for the people of Vietnam, in the sense that the fight would stop, uh, but not necessarily a, a good thing for the Democrats. I also think he gets around like the individual history as well. And what creates history is it individuals, or is it circumstances, the context, the systems, or so? Nearly like you've raised money, shot in March later, and you always die much more seriously. Um, then they then they actually they are tip and illness in the past presenters, and then in fact, I was praying with bedside and to see on the forehead, it's like, you know, God, it's like a bunch of people. Um, because if Reagan died, and you, the Cold War played out, of course, well, you would have President George Bush Senior. But Gorbachev would have still emerged. So, and I would have still been taught. Um, in terms of Bobby Kennedy, he's uh, he's my favourite Kennedy. Much more interesting chap. Um, I think it's also, he's, he's, he's like a wild animal, isn't he? Like, he goes after the mob. And then he goes after communists with, um, mm. with McCarthy, and then he goes after um, the mafia. Yeah, yeah, and then he goes after um, poverty. Mm. 
effects of like that kind of Olympics. So you can see the, I thought, of course, in terms of water scale, I mean, what well, we can, the Kennys have their own scale. So, you know, maybe the Kennys would have to put a K on uh, Kennedy's. Uh, no, I don't know. So, so, so I'll take your point. It's very really interesting. Thank you. Okay. Yes, please. In this country, we see newspapers affecting public opinion and the views of the editors and Murdoch, Dacre. Is there an equivalent in the state, or is it because it's so much more spread out? In fact, national papers don't have the same sort of influence <laughs> as local papers have in the states. It's the press. It's more. It's notionally reasonable. It's obviously about the New York Times, Washington Post, and National Red, mm -hmm. and. So, but it's still more, it's not the same thing, is it? But I think more like, well, you just more serious. You think it's changed more recently. Probably, more, probably television more. I think it's probably the bigger change. But you know, apart from the internet, you know, MSN, 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 um, and of course, increase like podcasts. And in many ways, the current election, which is very much like a podcast election. You get Bobby Kennedy Juniors, but you know, it's not having podcasts. Um, so, it often tries to like impact um, my life. So, I mean, it turns out to see the biggest impact on the press is um, altogether, which is, you know, the most important universities. So I think they didn't think much have a, an impact, but... Yeah, it, it's, it's not. The press it isn't. Uh, I mean, it, as you said, I mean, print press is probably not so important, then, but it, uh, it, it's not so politically oriented. Uh, it, as you say, there, it, it, there are only a few papers which are understood to be mentioned in the United States, and most of them are written. And it's overwhelming that Americans really feel regional. But even the national ones are not thinking of the kind of unverse political and sort of policy that the Americans In that sense, I think American history is rather better. I can't think of an example of this angle, um, but so it's you know, somewhat one, you know, that kind of impact of all these. It's a history where some of them might have a footnote in the other rack and the wall was there. Uh, you know, they were a bit offensive headline about, you know, she wants old folks from Britain, or, you know, Neil Kinney would have last, you know, turned away from the years. So I don't think there's a, I can't think of the impact of that. Yeah. Uh, but there is, of course, this issue of like a fake, not the fake news in the print media. So going back to the United States, essentially, Jefferson was really president, and the newspapers reported that Jefferson had died during the election campaign. And of course, he hadn't. Mm -hmm. But the idea was that, so, you know, if he's not to vote for Jefferson, it could be But also about the people like, Bad people on the moon, all sorts of like you know, in the print press, all sorts of uh, But the, the, the ones that do the bad people on the moon, even Ameri Americans don't understand them as newspapers. No. The, these things you buy in the supermarket. So it's not in Britain where people actually believe that it's some of the newspapers. Yeah. 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 What do you think of Biden and Trump? And <laughs> both comedians, and I think what the one thing that we have seen is what's far worse than the other thing. Yeah, we're going to have it. Before the 2016 election, I we gave a, a presentation in Leeds, it was a single politics of the park. And uh, you know, I said, well, there's no chance that Trump is going to win. So I'm not sure I'm qualified to say anything. No, no, no. I think the Biden Trump is a data in history say that Biden should win. In terms of like, if, if Biden's story is very comparable to Reagan's later for in terms of approval rating and common vision. So you also look at the midterms from a couple of years ago, the Democrats overperformed in the midterm. So actually, normally, as we know, in midterm, normally, whoever's not in the White House gets an ear. The Obama was saying he's shellacking with him and looking to But actually, the Democrats, then you lost the House of Representatives by approval of all the votes. Yeah, so actually, in terms of there's still plenty of Democrats out there on the vote, I just don't think it's very much a key job. So in many ways, just, and obviously, I think it's this bizarre scenario, actually, if you ask the the people, the political elite people, like the people in the Congress, if you ask the Republicans, do you want Trump? They'd say, no, never. We should, you know, we, we should never have it. We'd like to try to pass it. But if you ask us to put the base on Trump, they'll say yes, but still only eight percent do still totally like the Canadian has to drop out. You then have in the you know, the laws of reverse truth the Democrats are actually the, the Democrats establishing would be like all the media. So we don't really have you know, we do want by mm -hmm. But the Democrat voters don't want that. Mm -hmm. Because actually if you didn't have Biden, who would be the Democrat? Mm -hmm. 
But, you know, the Democrats are so actually very divided in terms of you know, the own culture war. And that's why Biden won in when the nomination for the 20th season the guy who Trump. But also, you know, get in the 2020 primary, Biden was losing. Then he has one picture of the South, South Carolina, and then they all drop out. Almost overnight, everyone else just okay. They were giving doors Biden. And he burned Bernie Sanders still actually ahead. Mm. Everyone else going to make a big trash. But they were dropping. It was like the, the donors all said, okay, Biden's hitting the guy because he's from, you know, he's Amtrak Joe, you know, he's from Delaware, you know, Scranton Joe, he's the kind of the every man who can do the job. So, of course, Thomas Biden was just, I, don't even, I think he's supposed to do the job, though. I think you can see an Obama campaign for him to get the job. But the way that Trump treated Jeb Bush, some people Jeb Bush, yeah. and the way he was treated was terrible. The odious Bush. Well, he treated Ted Cruz terribly, didn't he? Yeah. Then, no, Ted Cruz can't say nice stuff things about him, so he didn't he was very unique about Ted Cruz's wife. Oh, um, but now Ted Cruz is a big Trump. He's so, he's, no. he's dangerous, actually, Trump. He's dangerous. Any more questions? Yes, please. Do you think there's ever a chance that America will get democratic and have a popular vote rather this farce at the Electoral College? Uh, no, that's <laughs> Well, can you imagine the Americans now have they have, to have a, a constitutional convention? Or have to do an amendment? That's what that's two hundred and odd years, we still yeah. can't get it right. Yeah. It's a little stunning. Uh, I mean obviously our, our own electoral system is probably yeah. It's maybe not quite as good as it is. I don't think there's a grand swell of desire for change. It says changing is, is, is difficult if you've got a written constitution which was so invested in. Just to do an amendment to my guess. So, you know, um, so you, 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 obviously, you see the, the third, first amendment to abolish slavery. You have to go back to those reading the three courts in each house of Congress in the UCF states. But Mississippi didn't actually sign up on that amendment until the United abolished slavery. So, you know, probably, you know the ERA can write to the left hanging around for decades as well. Um, in terms of like, you know, women's health care, like, you know, if you wanted to, you know, I always feel like the Democrats need to get an amendment, but she doesn't work if you want to get the degree. I'm trying to have some kind of constitutional convention. But also, it's the, it's the money involved. It's what makes it exciting, isn't it? It's like, you know, everyone all the money goes to Ohio, Pennsylvania, and Michigan, so... It's, it's, the system is a total farce because yeah, yeah. The, 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 there's the, the popular vote, yeah. and then the electoral college can or cannot take the vote. In some states, they just take up. Yeah, it's, it's just I mean, limiting. That, that is true, That's which is a serious flaw with it, in that that's a possibility. It doesn't yeah. often happen. Right. It, 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 but I, I it's there. The electoral college is there. It's, it's a stop. A man person in prison. So I'm not one. Yeah, that's the case. Because the danger to a college really is not the fact that the cis or the popular votes, that the states in theory can go to whatever they like. They actually ignore the popular vote in the states. So say, for example, um, in my like, uh, Michigan, for example, this year they vote for Biden. Well, actually, you maybe have some Republicans, you know, really. The new way we're going to put it in the States. actually, no, we don't accept those votes. We can actually send our little ticket to get the votes in the name of Trump. Um, so, actually, and, and what the, probably the dangers for if you were you know, scared of Trump, the biggest danger for four years ago, Trump made a phone call saying, Does Georgia get me 10,000, 10,000 more votes? Mm -hmm. And the person said, like, No. Uh, but now they've probably got their people in place to be more willing to say, Okay, we'll come to the country. So that's the electoral close. Like, it's actually so ambiguously organised. Um, it's also why in 2016, where I did remember the sorts of Hollywood actors um, did a big video about you know the American heroes and basically all these like 30 electoral college members to be told to vote for Trump, to vote for somebody else, not Hillary Clinton, but like Mickey Mouse or whatever, you know, Luke Skywalker, or something. Um, and then it goes to the House of Representatives and the Senate. Um, so that actually, that's why not just the fact that it can, like you right to say, you could win 55% of the popular vote and lose it, still lose the election. It's the fact that you can still gain it potentially um, to have the way. There's quirks to that. Okay, there were just a couple more questions, so we'll take those. And the lads just said, do you think there's any comparable 
events on the Democrat side where issues or candidates that were seen as extreme in one election in a similar sort of time period have become the norm within the party? Uh, can I just, yeah. uh, if you look at Bernie Sanders, there's a, there's a recent book actually about how Sanders' kind of policies or what he wanted is actually being essentially being played out. Um, so in terms of like student loan forgiveness, for example, uh, by the dots all the towards that. Yeah. So actually, a lot of the policies of Sanders are you know, actually are becoming more mainstream. You don't know, follow up. It's all the you know, different instructions you have. Any question? Yes, please. Of course, I'm Jared Barnum, um, sort of three times the recent four years we've got elected, but it, it doesn't seem to be particularly groundbreaking personally in terms of um, ideology and changing the election. So, yeah. it, kind of, it goes with the this sort of, with yeah. the, you look at Biden with the, with the ages, the ages of Biden, very different. So, like, for example, in the 1990s, I didn't, he was it um, is it Anita Hill where she was testifying against uh, is it kind of Thomas Hill? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And Biden was a chair of the Judicial Committee. And his behaviour as the chair of the Judicial Committee, which he actually apologised for last time. Um, he's also the guy, you know, who voted for, you know, for a sport and like, like, the last of and lots of things. He's married. He's actually supported lots of kind of um, He's also, you know, Kamala Harris, in the last time around, called him up, called him out for opposing on busing. Yeah, right, you know, you know, the um, mixing of the stores. Um, so, because the Biden course, he's pretty much like a stone stone for 1988, where he copied Neil Killing. Um, so, just like Neil Killing was the first Killing in the album, he's getting the first day. Biden was the first Biden was now called the Killing. So, I don't know. John, what about John Kerry as well, actually? He um, uh, um, lost in 04, but actually made a big impact to settle through the Okay, we've probably got time for one more question. Anyone have any questions? Why do Americans vote for Trump? Guys, yeah, you know, a moral degenerate at best, isn't he? Um, and you've been talking about a continuum of conservatism, haven't you? Now, Trump isn't a conservative, really, in the traditional sense. He's taken over the Republican Party. So, actually, is the continuum of conservatism happening now with Trump or not? I mean, it's, it's a whole new ballgame, isn't it? And how can you have a situation where he's so patently not suitable to be president, uh, and yet there's a real chance, I think, that he could become one? And does it echo what's happening in Britain, of course, with the Boris Johnsons and Liz Truss as a, you know, the, the honesty police? You know? it, well, it's, it's populism, isn't it? I mean, certainly as far as the 2016 victory is concerned, it's striking from that Trump is that he told Americans what they wanted to hear. And then you capitalized on people who were uh, lost their jobs uh, on all the you know rust belt industries which have disappeared and accepted people that I'm going to bring back jobs to the United States, I'm going to rebuild the infrastructure. You know, all the bridges in the United States have fallen down. It's just as bad as it is. Yeah. So why do they still vote for him now? He hasn't done what he said. He hasn't done any of those things. Yeah, and the actual economy is in quite a good state, even though it isn't. Yeah, it is. It's because he's their guy. Um, obviously, it's a goal to survive a choice and get trouble, buy a lot of But if you think about, in terms of whether it's conservative or not, Trump calls the Democrat, you know, Wesley calls his wedding, you know, you know Charles calls his wedding, he's the Democrat, he's the Democrat, say. But Trump, I mean, he calls a Republican, he, he does fall the bill, the Republican wish list, in terms of the Supreme tax cuts, all of us, that kind of But think about, you know, say, so if you can imagine, it's what I say to the students, um, if you live in, say, Michigan or Pennsylvania or Ohio, and your grandfather used to be a union guy working with the car, car factory, and that car factory no longer exists, and now you and your parents are just working at Walmart, and you don't work for hours to qualify for benefits you employees, you can stuck on Medicare. Um, and in the meantime, you're seeing people get richer and richer and richer, you see the way you live for in the car. If you're in parts of Michigan, you're, there's lead in the water, and so you're living with poisons. And someone comes along and says, actually, Hillary Clinton and Democrats have always saying the same thing for 20, 30 years. That's a fair value. And he's actually, essentially, what have you got to lose? 
you forget that Trump, the, the person who's got more people voted Joe Biden to become president of the popular vote. That's something that anyone ever knows. It's got the highest votes ever for a president. The second highest votes ever went to Trump. Sorry. So it's fair that he actually increased his polling support in the last say, his status, African Americans. Well, people are kind of literally absent. So he wins because he's their guy. People basically are sick of the system that fairly or unfair to the economy that actually comes like, you know, do the okay. Well, actually, so well, still, you know, it still might be, you know, not so well. And also, in terms of the context of our time, if you think about the social media age, it's no more powerful, really, than the narrative that someone's having a better life than you do. And you don't think, why have a better life than you? Just put that in the board in California, or New York, or an actress, or something like that. And so it's almost like politics, like a lot of populism, where you let down by your leaders. <coughs> it seems like the outsiders, like, you know, and he's prepared to stand up to the people who they think are ruining their lives. Fairly or unfairly, whether he's done it or not, I'm not saying, you know, right, I'm saying that's the mindset. You know, they're not all a bunch of like clan and blood wearing racists, I don't know. People who are easy to speak to and being, but they actually much rather have this vision of America. Um, he's right, but some of his language recently on the <laughs> Memorial Day, and whatever, in stark contrast to Biden's, it just it makes you think. <laughs> it sounds terrible, but how can you possibly believe that, even if he's your guy? Is there not a decency somewhere that says, "Oh well, we, you know, if Trump wins now, goodness knows what happens internationally and all the rest of it." And and it begs questions, doesn't it, about the American psyche? Well, 50% of Americans probably agree with you. Sorry, say that again. 50% of Americans probably agree with you. The United States is divided down. Yeah. Really yeah. That's the problem. Okay. Interesting discussions. Um, I'm sure that both you and Andrew will all stick around if anyone has some questions and they haven't got to you, or if you'd rather not ask in front of the group. There is the Q, I don't know what the QR code is. There is a QR code on the board. However, I think you will all be emailed from the team. So when you sign up and you go to your email address, it would be really helpful to us if you could leave some feedback for today's event. And that would be very helpful and most appreciated. I really hope you enjoyed. Maybe we can just give one last thank you to Instagram. Thank you very much for coming, everyone. I hope you enjoy the rest of the festival as I did.